Hello students and welcome back to the Lore of the Iron Kingdoms with me, Professor Castor. And for all of you new students, just so you guys know, this is Lore from the Tabletop Wargame and RPG game War Machine and the Iron Kingdoms role-playing game by Private Geo Press. Today we are going over the character war beast of the Trollbloods faction. Um, they don't have as many as the Manoth group that we're going to be discussing, but of course the Trollbloods aren't nearly as old in the lore as the Manoth. So, we will be going over their three character war beasts that they have. Um, and then the following weeks we will be going over their Gargantuan war beast as well, who are surprisingly not characters, which is always odd to me that Gargantuans are not characters because they're so ginormous. But Stick around and you'll hear all about these neat characters that the Trollbloods have come up with. But before we begin, thank you guys so much for showing up to class. And if you could, if you are enjoying these, if you could hit a like and subscribe and let your friends and fellow gamers know about this particular YouTube channel. It does help the channel grow and does help us increase our class size and keep this steam drain rolling and also please share this with any of your gaming friends because that does help spread the word and gets us into this rich lore that the privateer press has given to us also thank you again privateer press for letting us read your fantastic lore and without further ado let's begin Dozer and Smig, adapting quickly to the unconventional tactics of the United Creels, Captain Gunbjorn has come to rely heavily on the antics of the duo of Dire Troll and Pig, known affectionately as Dozer and Smig. Plowing across the battlefield, Dozer generates an avalanche of destruction, while Smig, precariously clinging to the Dire Troll's back, unleashes explosive salvos of bombard fire. Each resounding blast of a tremendous cannon elicits the chorus of ecstatic roars from the dire trolls that fight alongside them. Dozer pays them no mind, as the constant fire renders him stone deaf within the first few moments of battle. He relies on the mental direction of Gumjorn, or kicks and nudges from Smig to turn to face the next most pressing foe, eager to see them blasted apart. In the time it takes Smig to ready the next shot, Dozer will sometimes take the opportunity to charge and tear apart the nearest enemy with his huge claws. The cannons he bears was salvaged in the aftermath of an assault on a Kadoran supply train. After seizing much needed supplies, Gunjorn's forces also carted off a massive bombard taken from the wrecked destroyer war deck. Having witnessed firsthand the power and utility of the Kadoran bombard, the warlock took the opportunity to refit the weapon for the largest dire troll in his retinue. Dozer easily bore the crushing weight of this weapon, its mount and its magazines, but adjusting the noise and concussive forces of the mudbard took some time. Early attempts to operate the weapon in the field met with mixed results. At first, each thunderous blast sent Dozer into a dangerous frenzy, swatting at his own back as he plowed headlong into the enemy. Over time, he became more accustomed to the gun's ear-splitting report but not before he maimed and consumed half a dozen hapless pig gunners. Only the enthusiastic Smig managed to hold on and keep from being devoured during Dozer's tirades. Since that time, a friendship has grown between them, and Dozer is now quite protective of the pig that joins him in battle. In time, the dire troll even learned to savor the weapon's booming report and the acrid clouds of smoke it spewed forth. Dozer and Smig have been inseparable ever since. And when you see him, he is definitely belongs to Gunjorn because he looks like a utility vehicle, like literally carrying supplies and all sorts of fun stuff on his back as well, making him even more imposing to look at than, well, even a normal dire troll. So the armor and everything like that, he is a sight to behold. And for the enemies of the Trollbloods, you do not want to see him rounding up because Weirdly enough, he is very accurate with that bombard cannon on his back. And <laughs> if you survive the salvos from that, you have to deal with Dozer when he gets up to you. So, yeah, he's very dangerous. But let's check out what he gets from Gumjorn and what he is like normal without without his warlock you know, in tow. Let's check out the Mark III to Mark IV changes, shall we? And then, of course, we will always start with his stat line. He is a speed 5. He is a... He is a Mat 7. He is a Rat 7, which went up from Mark 3 to Mark 4, so he's a little bit more accurate with both melee and ranged attacks. 
His defense is still a 12. His armor is still a, a 19. He is a Fury 4, Threshold 10. So he's he's a lot harder to get up to the anger than some of the other dire trolls, which I imagine he is very well trained with his Gunbjorn. Uh, he has the ability to trample, slam, and headbutt. He also has the ability to shoot outside of things he's in melee with, which makes sense since Smig is on his back, probably finding other targets that Dozer is not killing. Uh, he does have his dual attack, which makes sense since he does have a gun on his back, literally operated by another entity. Uh, let's go over his his abilities real quick. His bond with Gion Bjorn uh, did not change from Mark III. It says, if Dozer and Smig begin the game in Gion Bjorn's battle group, they are bonded to him. Dozer and Smig are not considered to be bonded while under your opponent's control, while Dozer and Smig are bonded to Gion Bjorn and is in his control range, they gain boosted ranged attack damage rolls, which is pretty staggering because he is shooting an AoE bombard cannon and getting everything boosted for free is kind of broken for an AoE, but uh, that is terrifying, which would make him a very characterized Jack, or War Beast, sorry. Uh, and the other move he has is Bulldoze. So when this model is base to base with an enemy model during its normal movement, it can push that model up to two inches directly away. A model can be pushed by Bulldoze only once per turn. Bulldoze has no effect when this model makes a trample power attack, which makes sense because you don't want people pushed out of the way when you're trying to run over them. And being able to push people around is always a very useful, getting him into even more terrifying positions on the field. So, And he can push through a couple of different people. It doesn't just have to push through one. If you have him just walk through, he can push you know, two or three models out of the way. So, And then we have regeneration because he is a dire troll. So this model can be forced to remove a D3 damage points. Once per activation, this model can only use regeneration during an activation. Oh, it cannot use this during activation at RAM, which makes sense. Uh, then he has snacking. So if he kills something with a melee attack, he can eat those. He can eat it and remove it from play, and he removes a D3 damage point. So not only can he regenerate, he can eat people, which is always a very, a very nice. Um, basically the exact same stats that he had in Mark III to Mark IV, so that is a fantastic. Um, his Bombard Cannon has changed a little bit. Uh, it is still a range 14 because it is Bombard Cannon. Still a rate of fire 1. Uh, its AoE has been reduced from an AoE of 4 to the AoE 3 which I feel like the AoE 3 stat and Mark 4 is a little bit more, you can hit a little bit more models farther away because you hit the three closest models within three inches. So very dangerous. It's still a PAL 14 and eight. So that's great. It still has arcing fire. So when attacking with this model, you can ignore intervening models, which I feel is better than Mark 3 because then it just ignores intervening models except in Mark 3, it said ignores intervening models except those within one inch. But in Mark 4, it's all intervening models because well, it doesn't make, it doesn't worry about that anymore. One of the things that it did lose was high explosive. So its its uh, blast damage is no longer a 10. It is an 8, which I feel like is more of a balanced situation because he is pretty up. Uh, he does a good amount of damage with that uh, with that cannon. So. And it's already boosted, you know, why add insult to injury when you're shooting your opponent. Uh, his next weapon is Claws, which are a Mat 7 range 1 uh, hand weapon. And it is a POW 15, which is still a pretty staggering. And if you have him up with another, with another, say, Dire Troll, who gives him, I believe, plus 2 to his damage rolls. And that's all damage rolls, not just melee damage rolls. So even his gun goes up to a 16 for some reason. Is it supposed to work that way? I don't know. Privateer Press will probably fix that in the future, but you know, right now use it to your use it to your liking. Um, but a POW 15 is still pretty staggering if you can get up into melee. You probably won't need him in melee because most things will be destroyed by the time you get up to them with your ranged weapon. Uh, his animus is Lucky Shot. It is a cost one range six. Ooh, you can cast it on people. Uh, turn or duration turn and not an offensive lucky shot target friendly faction model can reroll its next missed range attack roll this turn each attack can be rerolled only once as the result of lucky shot and then lucky shot lasts for one round so unfortunately this is a friendly faction model 
so it can't be cast on full units, which I feel like with the build with Gunbjorn, having a full unit with Lucky Shot would be, well, probably broken in the long run, especially with spray attacks. Uh, but Lucky Shot still a very, a very useful, uh, especially since Gunbjorn and this guy both like to shoot lots and lots of range attacks into the enemy, all sorts. So, but yes, as far as he goes, the only thing really different on him is the fact that his bombard cannon no longer has high explosive, but that it can ignore intervening models when uh, when attacking with this weapon. So, and I feel like that is by far one of my favorite abilities on the on the arcing uh, on the arcing fire. That would be my favorite uh, favorite weapon quality because you don't have to worry about any kind of uh, any kind of people blocking your target because you just shoot over them, which makes perfect sense. But Without further ado, let's move on. Molg the Ancient. Dire trolls draw upon the regenerative capabilities to achieve extraordinary longevity. Many live for centuries, and they become increasingly dangerous and tenacious with age. Reputably, the most ancient and ferocious dire trolls ever to walk Cain, Molg, is the paragon of that reputation. Indeed, he is old enough to have seen Orgoth with his own eyes. He has wandered the wilds of the southern mountains like the craggy troll king, demanding homage from all the trolls who cross his path. Even highly aggressive young dire trolls meekly retreat when Molg's heavy tread approaches their domain, abandoning kills in his path to assuage his endless hunger. Molg has experienced only limited interactions with Trollkin before he first descended from the mountains centuries ago to exact tribute. Envious of their sigils of power, he demanded runes he carved into the stony flesh on his back depending the many great deeds in ancient history. Mole can focus his primordial rage into these runes to stifle the power of enemy beasts set against him. Harlock Doomshaper first recognized the common thread of the ancient creature in the folk tales of scattered Signarn creels. The desperate legend described the tremendous troll a walking piece of a mountain. Obsessed Doomshaper made finding Mug a personal quest, which he pursued without result for years. Then in 603 AR, as he made his way to one of the deepest and most remote areas of the Wormwall, the shaman unknowingly stirred other full-blood trolls who followed to observe how Mug would receive him. They gathered near Mug when Doomshaper finally presented himself. The small and stooped Trollkin startled those present by invoking the traditional dire troll greeting ceremony. He put on a display of aggression and invited Molg to punch him in the chest. Consenting, Molg smashed his fist straight into Doomshaper's torso, shattering his upper body and sending him flying across the clearing. Harlock lay still as death until he could muster enough power to mend his battered flesh and stand. Though he coughed blood with every breath, he spoke words of respect to the great troll. No creature has ever survived such a blow and the ancient was so impressed he named the shaman Kroll. The two shared blood in primal ceremony, and since that time Mog has considered Kroll a tiny brother. The precise meaning of the name is disputed, but the most likely translation is not food. This represents a profound abstract concept to dire trolls, who are inclined to eat almost anything. Mog imparted so much respect to Harlock Doomshaper through this blessing that the shaman gained the unprecedented obedience of the other dire trolls. For most of his long life, Mog stayed out of the Trollkin Wars, content to prowl his mountains for food. Hunger gnaws at him constantly, even when he has eaten his fill. But when Doomshaper was captured and imprisoned by Signarans, the troll felt a call of his blood bond to Kroll and heard the shaman's voice in his mind. A surge of rage overwhelmed Molg's ancient brain, and he marched to liberate Kroll in a blood-fueled crusade, bringing with him an assorted of eager young dire trolls and leaving the fortress in ruins. Molg has readily left Doomshaper's side since. Well, being called not food by a dire troll, I imagine would be a great title to hold, because uh, dire trolls literally see everything as food or everything edible, and being called that by one of the most ancient of dire trolls who literally has a rune literally has runes carved into his back and actually carries a club or a club with actual runes built into it as well uh this guy is dangerous and this guy's always hungry but if you're not food to him 
that uh, that means something so but uh, yeah this guy is super super dangerous i've seen him in the battlefield i've seen him i've seen him take swings at warjacks that you wouldn't expect to do much but end up killing the accompanying warlock with him with just a just a backward swing of his club uh, inadvertently so yeah this guy is uber dangerous and even having him without doom shaper like having him seen him with any other warlock he is still pretty dang dangerous maybe not maybe not you know the crazy danger that he is with doom shaper but definitely definitely somebody you want to have in your in your corner at all times but let's read over his mark three to mark four changes and see what we got shall we and as always we'll start with the stat line he is a speed four because he's an old uh, he's an old troll uh, his mat is seven his defense is 10 arm 19 fury four uh, threshold seven he is easily raged uh, he has all the standard heavy war beast abilities of trample slam and headbutt and his abilities where this is where he really shines out is arcane vortex so this model can immediately negate any spell that targets it or a model within three inches by spending one focus or fury uh, the negated spell does not take effect but its cost is remained uh, with a doom shaper here's the fun thing if Mulg begins the game in Doom Shaper's battle group, it is bonded to him. Mulg is not considered to be bonded while in opponent's control. Mulg, while Mulg is bonded, Doom Shaper gains a plus one fury, which gets him up to a fury five, which makes him incredibly dangerous because you get a lot more work out of him than you would normally. So it moves him up from a standard dire troll to a, well, a character dire troll. Uh, his other abilities he still has hyper aggression or hyper regeneration remove d3 damage points from this model at the start of each of its activations that is a fantastic ability he doesn't even have to force himself he just regenerates because he's awesome he has primal rage so once per turn when this model suffers damage from an enemy attack after the attack is resolved it can immediately make a full advance towards the attacking model and make one basic one basic melee attack and once we get to his melee attacks, you'll see why that is so detrimental to people trying to damage him. And then he has Relentless Charge. So while advancing as part of a charge, this model gains Pathfinder. So he, g <laughs> he gains Pathfinder. So anybody who tries to slow him down with rough terrain, they'll just walk right through it. And then, of course, he has Snacking because he is a Dire Troll. When this model boxes a living enemy model with a melee attack, it can choose to remove that model from play. When it does, it, gain it removes a D3 a damage points from itself. So, yeah, all of those abilities, even without Doom Shaper giving him his plus one fury, makes him incredibly useful on the battlefield because it makes him incredibly dangerous for any of the any of his enemies to try to take him on. And he heals himself, like, without having to use focus or without having to use fury. It's remarkable. Well, let's move over to his weapons, which his weapons really haven't changed all that much either. Um, still a mat 7, a range 2, so it has reach, gives him a little bit more playability. Uh, it has a power 19, which swings about as hard as a as a Kodoran Juggernaut's axe, ice axe. So it does some damage, but it does have a lot more range than that. It is a magical weapon, and it has critical smite. This is probably what I saw whenever he launched his the war, war jack into his warcaster and knocked him out. So on a critical hit... The model hit can be slammed d6 inches directly away from this model. If the model hit has a larger base than the attacking model, it is moved only half the distance. The power of collateral damage is equal to the power of this weapon. So, because he slammed that guy, he not only dealt you know 19 damage to the guy he hit, but also 19 damage to the person that he ran into. And that is a pretty staggering amount of damage to be slammed with. So. And especially if you're not a heavily armored dude, 19 damage is probably going to remove most of you anyway. And his second weapon, because, you know, why wouldn't he have a second weapon, is Big Meaty Fist. So it is a mat 7, range 1, a hand weapon, and it's a POW 17, because this guy is a hard puncher. This guy, uh, this guy can... <laughs> this guy's open hand is more dangerous than some people's weapons. So, yeah, be... Uh, be very wary when you see this guy walk take into the field even though he's slow he still can move outside of activation and take a swing at somebody who swings at him so makes him super dangerous but let's read over his his uh, animus 
which I feel like his animus has changed a little bit. So his new animus is Spiritual Conduit. This model's controller can channel spells through it. Pretty easy. Cost one, range self. Very, very useful. Uh, probably not useful for your warlock, because, well, your warlock casting it on himself, that is. So, But uh, having having been able to reach out their range through him, very, very useful. I believe the original one was about the same. It's called Rites of Power uh, in Mark III. This model's controller can channel spells through it. When a spell is channeled through it, the model immediately suffers D3 damage points. So yeah, it is actually better than the original Mark III. He no longer suffers damage because I imagine those runes on his back allow him to, you know, be able to run it a little bit easier. So, But uh, yeah, he no longer suffers damage when he's doing his spiritual conduit. So that is fantastic. But yeah, this guy is a melee a beast. You want him to get in there. You want him to do the damage. He's he's not very hard to hit, but uh, most people probably want to shy away from hitting him anyway because his primal rage. So yeah, no, he's one of my... He's one of my favorites to see on the battlefield, but not one of my favorites to go up against, so... But, let's move on. Rock. For more than a century, the inhabitants of the frozen northern mountains have whispered of a beast of singular ferocity. When a remote village is found in ruins, its inhabitants missing and their taverns plundered, the northern speak fearfully of a dire troll called Rock. Like all dire trolls, Brock was motivated by his nearly insatiable hunger, and with each creature consumed his size and rancor alike increased. He hunted increasingly more dangerous prey, moving from giant elk to satyrs and even other dire trolls. He typically spurned humans as paltry were passed, although he would consume them to take the edge off his hunger if feeling particularly ravenous. He was in such a state the day he came upon a caravan transporting kegs of the dark beer preferred in northern Kodor. In his great hunger, Rock did not stop after consuming the guards, the merchants, and their cart horses, but went on to empty the large kegs containing their wares. He felt sated in a way he never had from the simple meal, stronger and ready to fight. He rampaged over the mountain and sought villages where he might find the kegs containing the intoxicating liquid he now craved. He terrorized villages across the north for days before finally falling into slumber deep within a cave. This might have been the best time to strike, but none of the Northkin could bring themselves to risk following the beast into its lair. Over the following years, Rock's thirst grew as great as his hunger, and his raids of villages for beer and spirits became legendary among both the Kadoran communities and the Trokan Creels of the North. When Borka Kegslayer learned the secret of commanding the great dire troll from the Shaman of the Gnarls, Rock was the beast he sought out. The two fought for hours, trading blow for blow. When both slumped to the ground at last, Borka drank deeply from his supply of potent brew and tossed Rock his own keg, and then another. Apparently pleased with this show of both combat prowess and generosity, Rock decided Borka was a worthy companion. The huge troll followed Borka down the mountain, knowing the greater fights and rivers of beer waited wherever the keg slayer led. So long as their partnership continues to provide ample drink and bloodshed, Rock is content with his lot in life. Well, that actually makes sense for you know him being Borka's chosen uh, chosen war beast, a, a dire troll who also enjoys the bruise of the Northkin. Yeah, I see that uh, he is very uh, he is very Northkin in his uh, in his setup, and he has a lot of uh, very powerful moves as well, and he's one of the few war uh, dire trolls that doesn't have to have a pig on his back to shoot out some ranged weapons as well we'll get to that in a moment but uh yeah a <laughs> can you imagine how terrifying that was for the caravan to realize that you know a dire troll was just searching for alcohol rather than you could just leave the alcohol out for him and he'd probably leave you alone but uh yeah that's that's very <laughs> unfortunate for the Kadorans in that uh, in that respect but let's read over his mark three to mark four changes shall we and see how much more dangerous this guy has become in mark four and as always, we will start with this stat line. He is a speed 5. He is a mat 8. So his mat actually went up a little bit from Mark 4. Or from Mark 3 to Mark 4. He is a rat 5. Defense 12. Arm 18. Fury 5. And threshold 7. So he does freak out pretty easily compared to his Fury stat. Uh, he has the ability to trample, slam, headbutt. He has immunity 
to ice damage and frost damage and such, uh, like most North can seem to do. He has dual attack, which makes sense since he does have a ranged weapon. And let's read over his abilities. There are going to be some changes here because, uh, well, certain of his abilities have moved out. Uh, looks like he no longer has assault, which he really doesn't need since he does have uh, he does have dual attack, which kind of takes up for assault a little bit. Um, he still has Berserk, so when this model destroys one or more models with a melee attack during its combat action, immediately after the attack is resolved, it must make one additional attack against another model in its melee range, regardless of whether that model is friendly or enemy. That is a fun one. Um, that is exactly the same. He is very into attacking, and if he kills something, he needs to kill another. Because, uh, well, I'm not sure if he's looking for booze on the bodies, but that is what he do. Uh, his bond with Borka. Let's see what we got here. Uh, appears to be the same that he had in Mark III. So if Rock begins the game in Borka's battle group, it is bonded to him. Rock is not considered to be bonded while under your opponent's control, and while in bonded to Borka, and in his battle, in his control range, Rock gains Stumbling Drunk. A model with Stumbling Drunk cannot become knocked down. If it is hit by an enemy attack after the attack is resolved, it is pushed D3 inches directly away from the attacker, which is kind of awesome for a for a creature like a war beast to have because him not being able to be knocked down means he's going to be just as annoying and moving d3 inches a direction you could literally have him walk out of melee range so he hit once and he just moves back nice um and that makes sense since borka is probably feeding this guy an ungodly amount of alcohol because we all know borka in the north can even have a giant keg that they can run, run around with them on the field which is kind of terrifying as well but they like their alcohol probably warms the bones i imagine uh his next ability still has his regeneration this model can be forced to remove a d3 damage points once per activation this model cannot use regeneration during activation it runs so he can heal himself like many dire trolls he also has snacking like many dire trolls when this model boxes a living model with a melee attack it can choose to remove the box model from play and when it does remove d3 points from it so yeah, very, very scary for a war beast. And yeah, a war beast who can't be knocked down and just gets, you know, moved around when someone tries to hit it or when someone does hit it. That's just that's just a nice little ability to have. Uh, let's go over to his weapons. He has frost breath, his ranged weapon here. It is a rat five, spray six, rate of fire one, pow fourteen. That is a powerful spray. Just saying. And he also has Gunfighter too, so he can shoot in Model C's melee with, so that's probably why they removed Assault, because he doesn't need Assault, because he can already shoot the model he's in melee with. Problem solved. It does do ice damage. And the special ability on it is Critical Freeze. On a critical hit, a model hit becomes stationary for one round, unless it has resistance to cold. So you can freeze him to the spot, luckily, and just take, uh, just take his big meaty fist and start uh, swinging. And his melee weapons, making him even more dangerous, are both Mat 8's. So we got Mat 8, range 1, POW 16 for his big meaty fists. And they are hand weapons, so he can throw people as well. And then his battle axe is a range is a Mat 8, range 1, POW 18, so it is a very significant melee weapon as well. You want to get this guy up in there, have him do his damage. He can heal himself, he can move around if people hit him. Very, very useful. You want to have this guy with Borka. Although, even without Borka, he's still a pretty dang dangerous Dire Troll as well, so... But, uh, you know, adding the special character war, or war Beast to their particular casters is always a smarter move if you have the opportunity to do so. Then, let's go over his Animus here. He has Primal. Target-friendly Living Faction War Beast gains plus two mat and plus two to its melee attack damage rolls. For one round and automatically frenzies during the next control phase so that's a that's kind of a hit and miss you really have to uh know you want that guy to frenzy so you want to get you know whoever you put this on way deep into enemy lines because you don't want him attacking your own dudes uh the target war beast frenzies even if it has prime removed by a spell special rule or casting a new animus on it prior to its next control phase yeah i feel like that last part was people trying to do weird shenanigans to try to you know stop them from frenzying but i'm glad they made a note to make sure that did not happen so and that's basically that's pretty close to the original although in mark three it only gave you plus one strength or plus one damage roll or plus one to your damage and plus one to your mat 
um, but did not cause you to frenzy, but having a plus two to mat and plus two to melee attack damage rolls. Like, even this guy, you know, you could get him in swinging a POW 20 on his axe and a 18 on his fist. And, yeah, that is that is some uh, that is some heavy stuff, but I don't think you would want to toss him in, you know, directly, because then you would lose him the next turn as he frenzies off. Although, if you do this correctly, and he frenzies, he has Berserk, so if you get him into a bunch of enemy models, him, you know, frenzying out and, you know, killing a bunch of people would still be a very useful thing and primal does last for one round so I, that would be something that now yeah, potentially happen so but that is that he's very dangerous when alcohol is added to a dire troll it makes them even more dangerous especially since this guy has frost breath a giant axe and the ability to kind of move around the enemies when they're trying to swing at him so i see the rock is a very a very useful guy to have in your army but that is it for the character war beasts that we know of for the troll bloods um not too many but of course compared to some of the older war machine factions they've been around a lot longer or at least you know their lore has been around a lot longer so that's why they have so many uh but next time we talk about the troll bloods we'll be going into their gargantuans because i think they have three or four off to look into it we'll find out what the archives bring up when we're discussing it uh, if you guys are still here, thank you so much for sticking around. And if you could, hit that like button. Please subscribe because that helps keep this class size going and helps the uh, helps the great upper management of the YouTube algorithms keep pushing this out to more and more players and helps us grow this class size and keep this steam train rolling. Also, please feel free to share any of these videos with your friends and fellow gamers alike. That does help spread the word about this YouTube channel, and it does help me a lot. Uh, also, again, thank you, Private Your Press, so much for letting us read your fantastic lore. And as always, class dismissed. <laughs>